Welcome back. I hope you've had a chance to start to build some connections in our networking function and chat with your peers about the learnings from this morning already, as well as gain some points through our gamification competition. We now move to our second panel using data to drive efficiencies. And we've long known that information sharing is vital within the public sector and data is integral to this so first, we must look at how the recent pandemic highlighted the data security and data implementation challenges facing the sector. What must also be debated is the importance of unlocking the power of data by removing the barriers to responsible data sharing, all whilst keeping the focus on the importance of improving lives the public sector serves. The government's national data strategy and DCM's S's 10 tech priorities support the significance of using data and data sharing to drive efficiencies. So here to look at how to make the best use of data whilst using best practice is Richard Walker, partner at Data Insights Agilisys, Pamela Cook, CEO of InfoShare, Richie Somerville, Head of Strategy, Data-Driven Innovation Initiative at Edinburgh University, and Bill South, Head of SRS Data and Governance Office for National Statistics. As for the last panel, don't forget to submit your questions using the live Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen. And throughout our panel debate today, I'll be keeping an eye on those questions and ask as many as I can. So uh, welcome to uh, all of my panelists. It's lovely to see a full house. You're never quite sure on a virtual conference whether you'll be getting a full house. Um, technology has transformed our lives and will be at the heart of our recovery. Richard, you've spent the last 15 years trying to help the public sector make better use of its data. What are your thoughts on that statement? Um, I, I think it's, it's it, fundamentally, really, it, it's sort of now or never, isn't it? So we've, you know, we've been talking about the power of data as a as an asset in the public sector for a very, very long time. And, you know, the likes of Pamela and Richie and I have been looking at lots of different ways and involved in lots of different projects um, that, that try to unlock the power of data. But I think the, the pandemic really did two things. It sort of made everybody an armchair analyst, didn't it? We were all glued to charts every day, you know, looking at things trending up, trending down, um, debating what it meant. Um, and really it sort of brought the, the value of data, I guess, to, to the forefront of the public consciousness. But what it also did, if you look at the NAO reports around um, what could we have done better in terms of our initial response to the pandemic, you know, it, it was sort of all, all too familiar that the access to data was a problem, the ability to share it quickly was a problem, a lack of standards, another problem, you know, and actually I think what I took from it was, was the sort of, the sense of frustration that despite having tried to do this for quite a long time, we're still in a place where those those old familiar challenges are, are yet to really be overcome systematically. So I think for me, it's if we're going to um, really enable the change that and the promise that we all see from data, then we, you know, we finally really do need to, to invest in those foundational elements that will that will help us drive that. I'm suspecting that Pamela's probably been nodding through a lot of things that you said there. I mean, Pamela, you've um, joined InfoShare more than 20 years ago. You've been CEO for a decade. So I feel, you know, you guys are so well ahead of the curve of the rest of us mere mortals. Um, do you agree with Richard? You know, uh, his sort of analogy that we've all become armchair analysts and, and also, you know, where this is going to take us now. Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think one of the, the key aspects that um, was very evident to us was also the fear, the fear that people didn't really have access to the data they needed to make some key decisions. And also the concern from the citizens is, well, who has my data and is it good? Is it good enough? And is it being used for the right reason? So I think there's been a huge um, new respect for data but also a, I think an equal amount of fear for how, it, how it's being interpreted. So whilst we were involved in you know, making sure that the identification of vulnerable citizens was, was paramount, but also those that needed to be safeguarded or, or um, kept safe, it wasn't always easy to identify. And I think the, the knowledge of the gaps in the data has been a really good thing in one way, because I think people can now realize that if they actually get it right, They've got they can they can support the citizens so much better. 
and um, and I think they can make much more empowered decisions strategically for the best things for the community. And using the data for good is, has got to be a, it's got to be a good outcome from this. Bill, I'm interested to hear how the Office of National Statistics facilitated the use of data in, in, in informing during the pandemic. Hi. Um, I, I mean, ONS, um, you know, I think did a, did a huge amount um, in, in a number of ways. So, so right at the very start, we stood up a number of um, surveys. Uh, directly to, to 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 provide data on something we we, we just didn't have a handle on. So um, the, the main COVID infection survey, which which was uh, which was used to track the kind of spread of the, the virus uh, in the community, uh, and was used to to inform decisions around sort of going into lockdown and and, the, and, the, and those tiers we had. Um, but also things, uh, 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 surveys relating to sort of understanding um, the social impact of COVID, how, how it was affecting people's lives, but also uh, the business impact of surveys. So, so there was a whole whole lot of stuff there directly um, based based on collecting new information. But we also did a lot of, of, of new work where we um, used existing data data sets and linked them together to to, to allow new insights and. Um, so, so one example would be we we, we collect the, um, we we have the death registration data, uh, but that doesn't tell you a lot about the the characteristics of the people. So, so that was linked to the 2011 census uh, results, so that we suddenly understood more about the you know, for example, ethnicities or perhaps the uh, jobs people are doing um, to to get a richer richer pattern. And and that data sets now now we've worked very closely with colleagues in in in, in health to link that to um, GP data and hospital episodes data. So suddenly you're 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 build, building a, a much richer uh, richer picture. Um, uh, you know we we also did a lot of analysis of those data sets and and we've also made those available to uh, in in our secure research service to to a wider group of of trusted researchers so that. For example, academics can can do analysis of those data as well. Fantastic, Richie. Yes, uh, last but certainly not least in this conversation, if there's anything you want to add to the thoughts so far? But then I wanted to ask you the most important things to consider when people are beginning that process of data sharing. And I'm going to have a mouthful of coffee while you answer that because this morning's flying by. I I think I'd I'd, I'd add to what Bill was saying that. Uh, what the pandemic probably did is accelerate the practice that certain people were wanting to pursue because there was an imperative. But that has also required us, uh, and I suppose I, I come from a, a situation where it's lots of academic colleagues working with public, private and third sector, to understand how you ensure that you maintain trust in those processes. So uh, whether that's through as Bill said, sort of safe haven type environments where the people that gain access to the data, so our researchers gaining access to that data, have to go through an ethical approach to ensure that the, the nature to which they're using the data is appropriate and that uh, individual uh, sensitivities are protected uh, is, is at one end of the spectrum. I think at the other end of the spectrum, what, what we've started to see, particularly around certain aspects of data sharing, is that there's a lot of data that has no personal identifiers. So it's not about individuals. It can be about mass populations. It can be about places where that data was already in the public domain. It was sitting in registers or in on, on people's websites, but often in formats that didn't allow the analytics activity to be performed in a logical, uh, sensible manner. And certainly what we've seen is an acceleration in a number of public bodies uh, to making their data more accessible in its format, uh, but also starting to ask the question of why shouldn't we be sharing this data? So more of an open data approach. And I think those that your question about what, what should you consider at the beginning of the process of data sharing is, well, what's the data we're talking about? What was the purpose it was captured for? Is what we're seeking to do going to better fulfill that purpose? Or is it a new purpose? If it's a new purpose, we may have to cycle back and ask those people providing the data the question again. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't then do the analytics but it, it's about understanding 
the trust that the people involved have in how you're taking that data and doing things with it. And, and that broad concept of the public good uh, and how that is experienced by individuals. I think you've really hit on a key word there. And I know just as, you know, an ordinary member of the public, I don't have anything to hide, but I, I don't like giving data away. And I certainly don't like giving it when I don't feel it's relevant. You know, when somebody asks your date of birth and it's not relevant to whatever you're doing online, how important is trust, Richard, do you think? And how do, how does the public sector garner that? trust from their citizens well um how important is it i think it's, it's probably the most important aspect of mm. of data sharing i think we probably all all agree to that um i think what we've seen is um you know over the last five or six years that, that i've been really quite focused in this area we've seen a sort of a growing maturity in the way that organizations are starting to consult with citizens. But I would say we're, we're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of a, a systematic approach to having conversations with communities about how we use their data. You know, we, we, we're not, I don't think we're yet making full use of technology, for example, to be able to engage a broad spectrum of society to then be able to, you know, to play back almost, look, we've consulted with you, we've, we've proposed these different uses around your data. These are the concerns you've raised and these are the different ways that we will control for some of those risks, right? So we have a, a mature conversation with society around how we plan to use their data. Um, I will say something that will probably be slightly controversial, though, is that I think, I think there's also an element of thinking about what's the value proposition to a citizen. You know, if you say to somebody, can I have can I have all of this data about about you and your health and well-being and all of these different things? Because some some researcher far, far away wants to use it for, you know, an experiment that they're running or whatever. It, it, that's that has been a feature of how we've asked for data before in the past um but actually if you come to them with it from a position of value delivery so if you're saying look if you share this you will get you know if it becomes a bit more of a transaction where the citizen has a sense of value around their data and they understand what it's being used for but also what they're going to get back you know from from giving their data then i think we'll be in a much more mature place where where we're able to ask more pertinent questions and, and as Pamela was saying make make better decisions then um, using that data so I think it's a little bit of both we've got to build trust but we've got to be aware that digital natives in particular will will very soon expect to get something back for their data in the same way that they do when they um, engage with private companies. Oh, interesting Bill how do you go about accessing um, you know that balancing the access to data with confidentiality if you like? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with the, the previous speaker, and look, many of those comments ring very, very true. I mean, in, in terms of balancing, I think it, it, it's it's fair to say that you know all, all of our data is published on our website. It, it, it's it's freely available, um, and any analysis we undertake, the, the data is there to support it. So you know, then that that's all part of that kind of um, you know build, building the trust. Uh, there, but of course that that is that's only the aggregate data. So it, 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 if you like, um, the the risk of to confidentiality is, is built into the design. But we do, we do offer, um, as we've touched on earlier, earlier, this sort of trusted research environment called the Secure Re Research Service, um, where 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 researchers uh, it's a very controlled environment, but they get access more to the the, the record level data. But it, it it's de-identified. But there's a huge number of controls in place, and it only works because of that. So we we have something called a, a five safes framework, and it's safe people. They have to be accredited, go through training. Safe projects, those projects again have to be accredited through an independent panel. They've got to demonstrate the public good. They've got to commit to sort of transparency. Uh, it's it's got to be um, f feasible and, and proportionate. Back to your point, you know that they can only access. The data they need to answer their research question. Um, <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I was just saying he agrees with that. I think. Yeah, I th I th yeah, he, yeah. He, he hears a lot of these conversations. I'm afraid. Yeah, I bet. Um, He's like, oh, so, he's talking all nonsense again. Hey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I knew that would happen. Sorry, apology. And it's somebody at the door, so he'll probably bark for a little while. But very, very quickly. Unless he um, doesn't bite them, that's okay. No, 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 no. That's fine. Um, 
so we, we have uh, you know safe settings again very controlled environment where people do the work um uh, the, the data itself, I talked about that, that that's, that's um, de-risked by taking any identifiers out. And, and finally, the outputs at the end of the analysis are, are cleared so that there's, there's no disclosure of, of people or businesses, depending on, on the research question. So, yeah, I say, and, and, and I think it's really important that, that that's, that's understood um, when, when people are, um, you know, using that data. I think we're going to be on that. Do you remember the show of, of um, you know, the bloopers clip? I think we... We might make we might make that today, Bill. But so, thanks very much for keep. keep I, I'll keeping. just go and I'll go and deal with that. But I'll be back. Yeah, no worries. Well, I'll talk to Pamela while you're gone. Um, are there some um, practical ways, Pamela, that local authorities can maybe overcome? You know, the, the some of the barriers we've been talking about to to data sharing. I think one of the things is we've got to think about purpose. Why do people think it's okay to share? So. Um, I would say that if you were a family member and you wanted the local authority to know that you had a member of your family who was particularly vulnerable, then you're going to want to share that information, right? Because you're going to want to make sure that if there is a flood that they have access, if there is a, a power cut that they have a dependency on oxygen or um, or they may have um, specific issues in the community such as um, autism. So you want to know that and you're therefore very, very willing to share. If you are being asked to look at it from a research perspective I think there's going to be some automatic concern because you don't really understand so on the one hand you understand why someone is vulnerable and wanting to share it on the other hand you don't really understand why and and I think in terms of the local authorities they need to understand that the information they have is incredibly powerful but they also need to um, think uh, going back to what Richie said earlier why have they got it what can they use it for and how is the best way of them using it? The biggest danger we have is that when they look at, let's say, early intervention, so which families are in crisis or which individuals need help, they only know what they know. So they'll go together with other agencies and they'll compare notes on what they know. The big issue is the grey data, the inf the, are those individuals whom they don't know. And they don't know for a number of reasons. One, the data is not fit for purpose or accurate. Secondly, mm. The citizen may disguise what their real issues are because of fear of being judged or because they have a vested interest through criminal means or others. So I think it's it's got, got to come back to trust and respect. So if, if local authorities are going to make decisions, they have a responsibility to ensure the data is accurate. From the point of view of, of barriers, though, and, and things they can do, is they just need to understand it's OK if the data is not great because for the purpose that it was um, input into a in, into a, a CRM or an Excel that was okay that was all that was required at the time we now just need to have more so let's pull together not judge where the data came from but pull together as a whole and look at it holistically and say right what is what is in the best interest of the citizens based on what we now know as a result of improving the information that we have and maintaining that accuracy which they need to do for GDPR anyway. Just a, a last word on sharing, Richie, before we move on to efficiencies. Mm -hmm. Is the bar set higher for data sharing in the public sector than in commercial settings? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, so the experience I have from working with across both communities is that most commercial entities have a much clearer understanding of what purpose they wish to use data for and how they might share it with partners. My experience in local government, certainly, I would say central government is slightly different, but certainly in local government, is that the, the, dry, the data revolution we've gone through has effectively challenged some of the organizational structures. So data is completely agnostic to the fact that you deliver housing, social care, education as separate pillars. Uh, because it's, it tends, what as Pamela talked about, you know, if you're looking at an, an early intervention for someone who's got some vulnerable characteristics, those characteristics may relate to a behaviour experienced within a school setting that's, that if linked to uh, under, characteristics understood about where they live, related to uh, previous family history, which are, is all knowledge that a local authority has. So it's all data that the, the authority has in its gift uh, that there is often a challenge put to the local authority. Well, 
at both ends. So if you miss something, and we have an event that we would rather not have, but you knew that, why, why didn't you intervene? But at the flip side, uh, also a criticism occasionally of, well, I don't want you to use that data to know all these things about me, yet it has been shared. And I think it comes back to Pamela's point uh, about purpose. Mm. I think we're at a point where we need, certainly at a local government level, a, re, a new retelling of what the purpose of local government is that links much more to public good writ large as a horizontal, as informed by the services it provides, rather than as a provider or a, a holder of a variety of different services. Because I think that the data revolution effectively is requiring us to reimagine those services in that way. Bit of a double whammy for you, yeah. Richard. Um, we'll move on to efficiencies. Where do you think the greatest efficiencies will come from data innovation? And also, what about revenue opportunities? You know, do you see the public sector being able to use data to generate revenue? I do actually, um, but I'll I'll, 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 do, <laughs> I'll do the efficiencies one first, yeah. and then I'll go on to the more controversial bit afterwards. I think. You know, look, I, I don't think what I'm about to say is going to be much of a surprise to anybody. I, th I think the real, you know, if you think about the data continuum that um, and the maturity continuum that Gartner has sort of popularized over the last five to 10 years, where you go from sort of describing what happened to being able to predict what might happen. And then further still to given given what we now think will happen, what should we do about it? And what's my next best action and those sorts of things. That's really where the public sector is going to be able to drive the greatest efficiency. So it's all very well understanding what happened and why it happened. But really, it's it's when we can start to get to, you know, our, our, the organisations that we work with are starting to ask us questions like, can you predict at an individual level when um, a, a care user's uh, needs are going to escalate and therefore the, the costs of servicing those needs are going to escalate. You know, can we use machine learning to understand determinants of length of stay in hospitals and how to stop the cyclical process of people going from acute care into community care back into acute and the costs that that drive for the sector? And that's just a couple of examples. But I think that's really where we're going to see the greatest efficiencies. Now, in order to get to that point, though, and make those sorts of technologies and those sorts of applications really, really sing and really deliver, you know, what was really pleasing for me in the last year or two, I would say, probably two years, we've seen government really take a lead on acknowledging that you can't have any of that unless, you, I, I use the phrase again, you fix the foundations. So you look at things like data quality, you look at standards and interoperability, because you need... You know, nobody likes, nobody wants to wake up in the morning and think, oh, might spend a million pounds on data quality today. You know, but but actually, you know, they, I think there's a growing realisation that that's the case. And I think when I go back two or three years, you know, I would have been sort of banging on the door going, invest in your data quality and then you'll be able to sustain your benefits. And, and you get a little bit of a frown and yeah, but I want some AI would be the, the sort of response. <laughs> Whereas now you know, it's more of an open door. There's a, there's much more of a realisation. So I, th I think that's how we're going to drive the greatest efficiencies. On the revenue point, I, I think there is, I think it's fascinating. I, I don't know if anybody came across the EY study a, a year or so ago that valued NHS data assets at something like 8 billion based on a, a comparison with um, the company 23andMe who do their digital profile, DNA profiling rather. And effectively what they did was come up with a per per record value and then multiplied it up for all the citizens in the UK who are service users of the NHS and came out with this really big number, which I thought was fascinating. But actually, if you think about um, how the public sector could, it's not necessarily selling the data as the Daily Mail would, you know, have <laughs> sort of a fit about is it it's it's how do you use it to leverage private investment that's that's the key here so actually if, if you think back to how local authorities for example tried to catalyze the housing market they had innovative joint ventures with the private sector that said well we'll put the land in you bring the capability to develop the housing and we'll share in the rewards and actually, there's nothing stopping us having joint ventures where we value the public sector's data input, because that's data that the private sector can't get hold of, um, or at least shouldn't be getting hold of. Um, 
you know, willy nilly. But actually, if you were able to ascribe a, a pounds and pence value to public sector data assets, then you can actually put those into a joint venture, have private sector companies help you innovate with that and then share in the rewards. And I, I think there's models like that that we will start to see over the next, over the coming years that will help, you know, help the taxpayer see a, see a return on the costs that are associated with um, looking after all of this data and, you know, hopefully improving it as well. Thank you for that. Um, Bill, how will ONS help government to deliver on its various data priorities and, and really unlock the potential of data? Yeah, I mean, you know, government have set out a number of priorities, um, which are all sort of underpinned by this, uh, you know, need for streamlined access um, and use and sharing of data. So we've got the, the this sort of wider civil service reform agenda, which talks about sort of seizing the full potential of data and technology. Uh, and I think in, in, in the, the intro, you talk about the national data strategy uh, and, and in particular, their mission free talks about um, transforming governance use of data to drive efficiency and improve public services. So it's, it's really at the heart of a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, what central government are, are you trying to trying to deliver. Um, ONS are leading on a cross government program uh, which will create the integrated data service. Um, and, and this is this is really very much in line with those those drivers um, and and the here the it, it will I've talked already about our trusted research envir uh, environment the SRS it, it will it'll incorporate that so it'll have a, an element of, of the, the, the that where where we can offer access um, to to sort of the, the wider research base uh, but it, it, it'll be much more than that because um, you know, it, 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 it well for a start, it'll be a, a better platform and now us to, to do more. But at the heart of it is is to increase the amount of um, sharing of data across government, and that's why it's really important that although it's an ONS led program, it, it is a cross government program. So um, we'll, we'll have more data uh, and, and building on the successes of things like I talked about earlier, the the public health uh, data asset, where where you can link different government assets to to create new insights. It'll it'll very much that that approach to try and um, Get get more streamlined access uh, to, to data to, to create those things in the first place, um, and and then uh, enable more streamlined access for for, for the analysts to, to use it. Uh, but again, it's really important to, to to note that that at the heart of all this will, will be those sort of principles we talked about earlier around the, the the kind of public good and the tracking and the monitoring and doing all this stuff uh, the right way. But yes, that it's uh, yeah really exciting sort of development that we're just on the start of. Thank you, Bill. We are drawing to a close, but Pamela, have you seen any examples of local authorities uh, doing it right, if you like, and what has been the result for citizens in those areas? If you've got a couple of examples, you might be able to share with us. Yeah, so I, I have actually, and one of them is um, was quite innovative in so much that um, local government in this particular area realised they didn't actually know who their most vulnerable citizens were. This is pre-COVID. And I think the difference between what Bill and Richard are talking about, that's aggregated data. So you can share data mm -hmm. that goes up. This is about individual level accuracy data. And they shared information with their local public health, the local hospital, the local police and three local authorities. And it was the first one of its kind with the objective of putting 140 vulnerability markers across all their citizens so that they could pull together. They did a, a very good um, data sharing paper. Um, they found a secure place um, to hold the data and then they put all of their data in there across social services and all of the various. And what they did then was bring uh, analysts like, like Richard on, on here to actually look at it and say, right, these are your hotspots of vulnerability and this is where, and they didn't know. So they didn't know about the person who'd just been released from prison who had a firearms um, certificate still valid when the health, health worker was going to go and who was very mentally unstable. And it was a female going there to the home on her own in a rural area. So those sorts of things. And the missing girl who's, and it's going back to what Richie was saying earlier, whose father had just been released from prison, but his mother was having a mental breakdown and she was suddenly absconding from school for the first time ever. ever. But they'd spent millions of pounds trying to find her and other miss, missing children. So it's about bringing that together and saying, what do we know? And there are some excellent examples of that, but it's got to be with a purpose in mind of, of supporting and protecting the citizens as opposed to doing it for any statistical benefits. So it's really got to have the right mindset. But the, the agreements are there, they're already, the data is normally available. It's just a case of having the confidence to process it to make sure it's accurate and then working with um, analysts 
like Richard's team to say, what do we know and how can we advise you forward from here? So there are some really, really strong and powerful examples. Wow. Um, Richie, just just in one line, if our audience could take away one thing from today's session to apply to their work, what would it be? And we do have to be very brief because we have our speaker waiting to take to the virtual stage. So if, if, if our audience is predominantly working in the public sector, I would suggest the, the, the thing you need to start this afternoon is having a robust data catalogue. So catalogue what data you have and then start to do, as Richard talked about, what's the quality of it? Because you're probably making really good decisions on imperfect data at the moment. You could make even better decisions if the quality of the data was improved. And if you're going to move to machine learning or AI or all these things, you're going to have to get that stuff right. Final per end word. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of my panelists, uh, everyone who took part in the panel. It's been really interesting to look at how data can be used to improve the lives of all of us and the work that goes behind this. In a moment, I'd like to welcome Stu Higgins to the virtual stage, head of Smart Cities and IoT Public Sector, Cisco. Stu is responsible for all smart city projects within the UK and for Internet of Things solutions within the Cisco UK public sector team. He's a passionate advocate for how digital technologies can be used to improve the lives of people living, working, learning and having fun in large and small communities and believes that technology has a role to play in addressing the challenges we face every day. He'll be discussing how he helps towns, cities, regions and other communities digitise their environments and address challenges that residents, visitors and those in the workforce experience every day. So uh, it's over to you, Stu. Thanks, Helen. I'll just put my presentation into slideshow mode. Um, morning, everyone. It's been really interesting to listen to um, both sessions so far. And, and what I thought I'd try and do today is uh, is bring some of the elements from those conversations and the ones to follow, uh, which is always interesting because I know, don't know what those people are going to say um, together in the, in the next few minutes. But uh, as, as Helen said, I'd, I'd lead on smart cities for um, Cisco. And the really interesting thing, those those connected places are the, are the catalyst for a lot of what's been discussed so far. So um, I think I'll start with um, just a, I, I thought I wondered where to start and thought a good place would be, you know, where are we now? What's changed? What's what's the same? And and I think Jeff said he didn't think that the the pandemic had changed. I totally agree with him that it's accelerated them uh, rather than made massive changes, certainly around around digitization. But having said that, solutions are now accepted and expected by a lot more people than they were even two years ago. And, you know, people just expect to be able to do things in a very different way to how they used to. Um, but equally, the flip side of that is we've got to make sure we talked about access through different devices, through cloud, through smart things through IoT devices already this morning. There's there's a whole heap of young people, older people and people in between that either don't want to or, or aren't familiar of you, of how to use those devices. Um, something else, there's there's um, a level up fund and every level straight from the, the instructions for it has, has been allowed to submit at least one bid worth up to 20 million pounds for help in post pandemic recovery. And I've certainly worked with a, a number of, of authorities looking at how technology can be used as, as part of that um, leveling up process. On the healthcare side of things, there's a new hospital program. And, and yes, it's true, not everybody's getting a new hospital, but there are plans to build 40 new hospitals by 2030. And a, a massive amount of money has been committed so far by the government to do that. I think what's really important, though, is that there's a there's a lot of other existing hospitals and healthcare facilities that have also been looked at to be upgraded or renovated or, or changed. So another big place for potential digitization. And then you've got, as well as the um, hospitals, you've got the integrated care systems, which are starting to create part or are creating partnerships between organizations that, that deliver health and care across an area so really interesting change and, and when you look at places like greater manchester as well with it with devolution and north of tyne and lots of others you've got this whole thing where there are many many things coming together to um give us a 
to start to make changes. And then something that's appeared really in the last couple of years, the whole piece around social value, around sustainability challenges, around carbon zero targets, and, and then of course the, the dreaded supply chain challenges that we've got right now um, across all sorts of things, whether you're buying a new car or whether you're looking for technology, they're challenges that we've, we've got to face. Um, when you start looking at technology more specifically, um, you've got to think about fiber infrastructure and, and it's been talked about by Jeff already and, and the huge amount of investment he said has just been delivered into the Norfolk area. Well, it's the same across the country and, and that infrastructure is spreading and it's providing almost unlimited speeds into lots and lots of different locations. But it's not just the speed that's that's important. It's the fact that affordable connectivity is more available than ever. And, and actually, one of the problems with what's happened during the pandemic is that it's not a lack of access to connectivity in many cases. It's the fact people can't afford it. So we've got to make sure that there is affordable connectivity available, not just to businesses and to the public sector, to, but to people at home as well. Um, I, I thought the conversation that was just had about um, data was was really fascinating and there's been an acceptance that there's a real need for sharing data across organizations but the flip side of that was your question helen about trust so how do we convince people to share data with us and i and i think the point that was raised in the last session about um showing the value of why you want the data is a really good one uh cyber security massive challenge keeping us all away we all get i imagine emails every day of people trying to convince us to do things that maybe not for the for our uh, best intentions but equally as you start to digitize more and more things more data is available collectively so we have to be very careful how we consider how we protect that data and only make it available to to those people or systems that genuinely need access to it something else that i've I've been involved in, in in a few conversations up and down the country. We've got a massive problem with, with digital skills, and it's not just the skills you might think about or read about in the paper like cybersecurity uh, experts and, and other people, programmers, digital expertise from the people in the in the panels we've listened to so far and will later on. It's it's right down to the simple um, civil engineering practices as well. So if you think about HS2, which is a massive engineering project that's also going on in the UK, they've taken a lot of the people that do that civil engineering. So physically digging the fiber into the grounds, which is where a lot of this starts from, is also a massive challenge. So it's it's skills right across the board for delivering digital, not just those digital skills that you might traditionally think about. Uh, the, the oldie but goodie, um, we've all got less money to spend across the public sector and a challenge of where you actually spend it. And then, uh, you know, again, off, off the last conversation, the piece around data is really interesting. We've got loads of it. We've got more data than we know what to do with. Uh, but it's in all sorts of formats and it's not always useful or usable. So we have to consider not just whether we make data available, but how we make it available and whether we make it usable. And then the other thing about data, even in public sector, people are now considering how to monetize it to, to uh, again, to the point about the value of data in the NHS. There's, there's a potential to, if it's appropriate, look at whether to make money from some of the data the public sector holds. And that's really important because to offset those challenges of lack of budget, you've got to look at ways of funding things that maybe even a few years ago would have never been considered. And, and I think that's the really important thing. We're, we're at a moment in time right now, one which will set the direction for digital transformation, I believe, for the next 10 to 20 years. And the reason we're at that moment in time is we're coming out of the back of a pandemic, but I think this moment in time was there before that started. Uh, to be honest, technology is delivering um, in ways even a couple of years ago it wasn't. There's a desire from public sector organisations to make a change, and industry is 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 also at a point where it's ready and capable of helping to deliver that. And I think the best way that I I think about this is. Um, I, I work for an infrastructure company and often you hear people blaming the network, even if you're on a, a WebEx call, um, somebody will say, oh, sorry, my network's not very good today or you'll get broken up conversations. But equally, when you're trying to deliver massive amounts of data across a town or a city, you need a really reliable infrastructure. 
and you don't want people saying, oh, well, we could have done the network's causing us a problem. So imagine how you do things differently if you had secure bandwidth that connected everything and everybody. Uh, and more importantly, and if that could be securely delivered to move data to people and systems that need it the most, I, I think over the last um, couple of years, I've, I've realized that in a lot of cases, actually it's not the tech that's the bottleneck, it's the people with the skills to interpret the data. So if you look at an example where you, you take an MRI scan, there's a massive amount of data and those scans are going on every day. The people or, or the thing that limits how fast they can get through reading those scans is the, is the radiographers that can interpret that data. So at the moment, in a lot of cases, those people still need to go somewhere to do their job. If you could deliver that data to them wherever they were through some sort of um, electronic communications like um, the tools that we're using today, then you'd be able to increase the the ability to interpret that data and, and let's face it, get results back to people that are worried about why they've had a scan in the first place. So I think we're, we're, at, a, we're at a place where we've got a chance to think differently about absolutely everything. So so I would I would challenge everybody to look at services and try and avoid that corporate memory which says oh well, we tried that two or three years ago and it just didn't work because technology is not the same as it was a few years ago uh, the challenges aren't the same as we had a few years ago and and it's a chance if you really think about if you knew you'd got secure high speed connectivity across a region regardless of how you deliver that how would you deliver education to people which we've all had a, a whole heap of uh, examples of where it's worked well and not so well over the last two years. How could you deliver healthcare in a different way? Do people really need to go into a GP surgery to get their blood pressure checked every week? Do they really need to go to places just for repeat prescriptions? Uh, is it possible to talk to people remotely, at least for a first triage of a, of a problem so that you can have those highly skilled and, and um, time poor medical professionals spend their time with people that really need it? Uh, you know, whatever bit of the public sector you think about, there are better ways to do things if you take the limitations of the technology away from it. But having said all of that, I, I think that, 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 that we, we need a bit of a reality check. And um, I'm part of the tech industry and I have been for a long time. And and there's a real danger that what people do, they'll, they'll come into your office and they'll they'll tell you how terrible things are at the moment. So they'll tell you that they're kind of um, stuck together with sticking plasters and bits of string and you know interestingly you can see from this this house that um, somebody's bothered to put new shutters on on the the walls and you might wonder why they've done that but you know the analogy is quite good because people do patch technology solutions and they grow over many many years and and suddenly you're adding more and more stuff and you end up in a place where it's incredibly complex you've lots of suppliers um, things maybe don't work as well together as they ought to. There'll be stuff in the systems that, that, that frankly isn't necessary anymore, but you've just not had the time or the ability to remove that, or, or you've got a fear that if you take something out, it might affect something you hadn't thought about. So I think we, we're, in, we're in danger of thinking about things all being creaky and just held together. And, and the, the, uh, the other side is then, and this might not be your ideal um, new home, but I'd quite like to live here. The, the reality is that um, people come in and say, we can, we can give you this. So we can take you from this to this. Imagine how life would be different. Imagine how you would deliver services. Imagine how you do a lot of the things that I've just discussed in the last few minutes. But um, what, what is really hard is figuring out how you actually get from a to B, and it's something that I think uh, is starting to change. But that transition, that roadmap, that you know, the the hills and valleys that you're going to go through, the left and right hand turns, it's you know, figuring out how to get to the destination and getting value at each stage of is really important. So it it really doesn't matter where you start from, but you have to consider it in that broader context of what's the end result, because otherwise you end up in a situation where um, you can you can feel incredibly frustrated by looking at how you deliver something that might suit one department or one particular 
group of people brilliantly, but then not work for anybody else. So how do you think more broadly about the system in general and, and how you might look at delivering things once and using them for lots and lots of different things? And and I don't think it's it's just a case of stepping back and and thinking a little bit more carefully about the strategy and the direction and and maybe not having a separate digital strategy, but having digitization underpinning a lot of your business strategy, a lot of what you're trying to deliver. And, and I heard it a few times earlier on, and, and um, it was Owen, I think, that said customers talk about the endpoint as the cloud. And, and, that, and I really in, I, I agree with what he said. The cloud's not the endpoint. The endpoint is the result of the thing that you've delivered. So did I find a parking space in less time? Was there a diagnosis of a, a problem I might have with healthcare? Uh, did somebody get a better educational experience from what they did? It's not about, and therefore get a degree, it's not about how you deliver the technology. But having said all of that, I, I do work for a, uh, an organization that provides some of that underpinning infrastructure and, and, and Cisco have talked for many years about the, the whole systems approach and, and about a way of delivering something that's fit for purpose, but not for one thing, for many things. So if you put that platform, and it's a massively overused term at the moment, I appreciate that, in, in the center of your digital strategy, then you can start thinking about all the different partners that might be able to leverage that. And we're starting to see examples of this across the country with people going out to, to uh, procure solutions to provide that underpinning underlying architecture and enabling people to build on top of that. So all of the organizations in the, in the light blue section across the top of this slide can feed into and make use of this single high performance, scalable, secure, yeah, flexible and innovative, but equally sustainable solution. And then if you think about the stuff across the bottom, it's enabling people to get value, regardless how you're trying to um, work with the public sector or what services you, you're a recipient of. Uh, and something else that came up earlier as well, you're trying to create a more connected, more caring community because there's a danger with technology that you can isolate people. If, if you start making automated deliveries of drugs to someone at home, the postman or woman could have been the only person they see in the morning to have a conversation with. So you have to be very careful that you use technology for joining people up, not for removing them from society. Uh, and, I, and I think the other thing I mentioned supply chain earlier, it's going to be difficult getting hold of some technology for a little while. So how about going back and looking at the things you've already got within your environment and considering how you might get more out of them if, if you use any microsoft products or other other types of word processor or um, presentation product then you you probably use 10 15 maybe 20 percent of that that solution the same is true with a lot of technology that's provided so how could you go back and look again and see where you could maybe look at how to address some of the problems you all you have with things you've already purchased and think about using the same technology for multiple solutions. I, I live not too far from London, and there are five or six different CCTV cameras on some poles in the city center, all providing video streams to different services. Why can't they do that? With like, Number one, it'd look a lot better. Number two, it'd be simpler, it'd be cheaper, it'd be more integrated. And each of those organizations could take from that video the data that they need to deliver the services back to the public. So I think Jeff talked again about the, the importance of fiber. And I think if you think about a digital transformation, it really starts with connecting things up. And so that unlimited secure infrastructure that I talked about, it does all lead back to that very high speed backbone. So fiber is a critical part of this in every kind of conversation. But equally, what you want to think about of it is, is not as one way of doing something. For all the organizations that you re represent on, on this call today, it can provide those core services, the local area and wide area networks. It can connect you to the cloud that's been discussed a little while ago. It can provide applications locally and remotely across multiple sites and enable you to do all the things you do for your day job. But equally, that same infrastructure can deliver services to citizens across all of the, the boxes at the bottom on the right hand side whether it's health and safety, whether it's better utility provision, uh, transportation, uh, education. And then that same infrastructure, again, can be used for 5G 
Wi-Fi 6 for other carrier type solutions, whether they're provided by a, a large uh, telco or whether it's a private network that you and maybe even monetize for third parties to make use of. So there's a there's a concept called a, a neutral network. So it's possible for a town or for an area to to manage that and then share it out amongst providers and therefore make some revenue from it. And then again, the same infrastructure can be used. I've, I've called it the street layer, but if you've heard, you might have heard the terms smart cities or Internet of Things. This is the, the bit where you're connecting all of those hundreds of thousands or millions of devices together and taking that data back somewhere and then combining it in ways that maybe haven't been thought of before to provide better services and better insights. So I think I'd, I'd, I'll just leave it by saying, think about things that even five years ago you'd never have done. And and and, and that second point, that taking that opportunity to reimagine service delivery. So go back and look at things and ignore the corporate thought that is we tried that it didn't work it's worth going and looking again and keeping the back of your mind that how would we do this differently if if we had unlimited secure well-managed infrastructure and don't get dragged into the it's got to be 5g or it's got to be fiber or it's, you, you need to think about it if i could connect that thing or that person to the service they need what's the best outcome that that we're trying to achieve the technology will fall out of that thought process not you shouldn't do it the other way around and again somebody earlier mentioned that um ask the people that are going to receive the services what they want and think about that and engage citizens much more and ask those people how they'd like to see it some will still want a face-to-face -face meeting some will say you know what i don't want to ever talk to anybody again if i can do this automated so um find a balance and a way of delivering things across multiple different solutions and, and, and make sure data is useful, not just available. There are lots of um, data sets across the country that have been released by different cities and some are great and some are terrible. So make sure the data is in a format that's usable and can help to add benefits. And, and then I think um, you need to build that platform and lots of organizations have already made uh steps and inroads down that but then you need to exploit it and you need to get everybody on side to keep going back to that and saying how can we do that through? and um so i think that's really a point where i'd say all of this is really important but the thing that's most important is you need to focus on better outcomes so it's all about you and me as people not about us as technologists so how can i get the most from digital transformation delivering things for for everybody that we we help across all our communities thanks very much things that we've already discussed this morning that was smashing and your thoughts on skills uh, will be taken forward into our next panel. I was certainly captivated listening to everything uh, Cisco's been up to and uh, I'm sure that Stu really engaged with you, our audience too. We're going to take a break now, which means another opportunity to network with other delegates. It's also a chance to recharge and process all the knowledge that's been shared already. So enjoy. Our next session starts in 10 minutes time. I'll see you then. <laughs>